those of you who are in the room, big welcome to all of you. For those who are watching online, welcome to you guys as well. My name is Josh, uh, one of the pastors here. And this week we're beginning our new series, Investigating Jesus, How We Know and Why We Follow. Now before we get into that, I just want to give a quick um, double plug of Alpha today. Um, thank you Ruth for sharing about that and, and pointing out on the back here a chance for you to pray and look to who you can invite into the Alpha space. You'll notice on the back of the card it says three things. It says pray, serve, and invite. Pray, serve, and invite. Um, if you're someone who, uh, who, who's looking as to how can I help, and a few of you guys have responded already, thank you so much to that. We'll be in contact um, to make sure everyone gets moving. But if you're someone who, who goes, I want to help, I want to be there on Monday nights assisting in some way, uh, then what we've got coming up on March 30th, March 30th, um, here at the church is some training as we prepare for Alpha. So you'll see more stuff coming out through emails, and we'll be plugging this very heavily for the next few weeks. There's opportunities to serve in welcoming, in the kitchen, getting food ready, table leading, um, there's, there's, uh, at the back, making sure that we can see and hear the videos and everything. There's lots of ways that you can be involved in making Alpha a great space, and just Put in your calendar, uh, March 30th, here at the church, 7 to 9 p.m. We're going to go through some training and, as we prepare for that. Because, uh, funnily enough, things just don't magically happen. Uh, it takes work and preparation and everything. And on that night will be a great chance to come together as a team and, and set up Alpha to win so that it can be a great space that you feel comfortable inviting your friends to because we know that it is a space that's been prayed over, thought through, and prepared for those who are coming. So if you want to be involved, March 30th is when we're going to have a training night for that. And we'll make sure everyone's on the page, same page for that thing there. But yes, Alpha is a really big deal. We're going to hear um, some testimonies over the coming weeks as to the fact that Alpha matters. Creating spaces for people to chat and explore and engage with faith is really, really important. Especially in our modern context, where if you go up to someone and say, let's have a faith conversation, their response is generally going to be, okay. You know, it can be quite, you know, don't talk about faith, don't talk about politics too much unless you want to go on Facebook and really hammer it out. Um, but most of the time, people want to avoid those sort of topics. We want to create a space where people can come in, can ask any question, and they have an opportunity to meet Jesus in that space. So we really want to make sure that it goes well. So I just want to keep plugging that. You'll hear Alpha, Alpha, Alpha over the next two months because we just really believe it works and that it's an opportunity for people to encounter their Heavenly Father. So I just want to encourage you in that space. You'll hear more as the time goes on. Let me pray. Father God, thanks for our time together today. I just pray that as we have a look at Luke, that you'll be able to open our eyes to some things, that there will be practical things we can take into our week. But most importantly, God, wherever we're coming from, whatever our situation, our story is, um, that you'll just meet us in this space right now and remind us that you're with us, you're for us, and encourage us in our next step in our faith journey. In your name, for your glory. Amen. Amen. So when it comes to knowing if there is a God, when it comes to knowing what God is like, what he believes, what he wants for us, a lot of the time we ask the question, does it really need to come down to the Bible told me so? Does, is that the answer? Is the answer about who God is, what God has done, what he wants for you and from you? Does it come down to this answer of the Bible tells us so? The only reason that we know um, and the reason we're expected to believe is because there's this book there's been written by multiple authors across a lot of years. And uh, these people, many of them, most of them men, who never met each other, are we meant to believe, yeah, that's what God is saying to us? Are we meant to go, yeah, that's what, what is happening? Because of all these people who read all, wrote, wrote all these things, it got collected. Are we meant to just believe based on this collection of ancient manuscripts? I mean, if we're real and we think about it for a second, and if you've been in faith for a long time, you probably haven't even thought about this for a while or if at all. Think about the people who put it all together. Back then, science, very limited. Um, the understanding of geography of the world and different peoples of the world, very limited. And back then, it just seemed that everybody believed in a god. Gods were everywhere, multiple. And uh, the fact that this particular group of people had one god is interesting. But back then, gods were just all the rage. So how is it that we're meant to believe in God and who he is? Are we meant to believe based on all of that just because the Bible says so. Now, I'm not surprised in our modern day and age that people are reconsidering their faith, they're deconverting, deconstructing, and trying to wrestle with who God is and what God wants to us based on the fact that if we, as people who follow Jesus, go, here's the book, just believe. Here's the book, just believe. People start to dismiss faith and dismiss that we could even have anything meaningful to say. And if... 
if the Christian faith does balance precariously on the edge of this big declaration that these ancient manuscripts, are everything, the be all, end all, one falls over, all falls over, then why not? People should be deconverting, deconstructing, figuring out their faith. If it all came down to, if our entire Christian faith came down to the fact that these ancient manuscripts and everything that in the Bible and how it's presented is 100% everything of everything, then of course people are going to struggle. People are going to struggle. But it turns out that Christians are not expected to believe based on a collection of ancient manuscripts written over hundreds of years by multiple authors. Our faith is actually grounded to a much more real, tangible thing. And I dare say it's something that we can even investigate. I struggle with this word, investigable. Is that how I say it? Sorry, chuck it up there. Huh? Investigable. When I try to say it like it's a million, it's a struggle all week trying to nail that word. All right. I believe that you and I are actually invited to kick the tires of faith. We're invited to ask the tough questions. We're invited to ask hard questions. We're invited to not just go, oh, it's a mystery and shrug it off. The Christian faith doesn't rise and fall on the accuracy of the 66 documents that we call the Bible. It rises and falls on a single individual, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth. So if you're someone who's curious about faith, if you're someone returning to faith, or maybe you're someone who finds that you're losing faith, then here's a question to wrestle with. And it's not the traditional question, is there a God or is the Bible true? Normally when we ask those questions, they tend to be off-ramps to faith. The question that actually, those questions normally involve people deconverting, deconstructing or dismissing Faith, But if you're someone who's struggling, then there's a better question than is the Bible true or is there a God? The question that we should be asking when it comes to approaching the Bible is, is Matthew, is Mark, is Luke and John accurate, reliable accounts of actual events? Is Matthew, Mark, Luke and John a reliable account of actual events? If so, if they are true, if Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are accurate and reliable, heck, I dare to say, if just one of them is true and accurate, reliable account, then our faith, it's faith on, it's game on. We have an opportunity to engage with something. You should press and lean in. But the thing is, is that this is confusing to us. And as I put up there, I see a few people going, hang on a second. Generally, this is a little bit confusing because of how the Bible is first introduced to people. And I've actually got a picture. Now, I drew this. Feel free to laugh. It's fine. Um, I did my best. But here's a little diagram, which if you can't see, don't worry. It's not a work of art. I got stick figures. Anyway, um, here's a little diagram to help us bring out a bit of a timeline for what happens. Because for many of us, when we were introduced to the Bible as a kid, or when we first believed, the way the Bible was handed over to us was, here's God's word, everything in it's true, everything's equal, it's all believable. Go. The problem is, is that that's not how the Bible actually was formed. And that can be very... Um, troubling when it gets handed to us and say everything in it is equal, everything is valid and then you go to uni, then you chat to some friends, then a grandparent chats to you and starts to make you think through, is that actually true? And then suddenly you start to to, to go, well I don't know, I can't believe that part and then it all falls over because we built up our faith that it has to be completely everything true, everything accurate, the whole Bible, all valid and then we end up falling over in our faith because something isn't what we thought it was. And a lot of the time when that happens, it doesn't have something to do with Jesus. A lot of the time it has something to do with something from the Old Testament. So, how do we get to our Bible? So, 2,000 years ago, Jesus was walking around the earth, healing people, saying things. He had a band of supporters. He had a band of opposition. And eventually, he died. Spoiler alert, if you have not read the New Testament yet, or if you're not familiar with that, Jesus dies. I saw a great video this week. Um, The people are in a, a, a... Group, uh, a uh, what do you call it? Like a, a reading reading group, and this person's like, "All right, we're going to turn to Matthew something. We're going to see how Jesus died." And this person's like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! He dies? <laughs> G- the Jesus, the G- Poor spoilers." And he's like, "Yeah, but he comes back to life." And the guy's like, "He comes back to life." roller coaster of a book. Um, now, for many of us, we've just, that's what's happened. They didn't know that was happening at the time. So when he hey, when he came back to life, when there's re- that's a tomb. 
I mean, specify. Um, when he came back to life, and when he, when, he, uh, when he was resurrected, again, people started going, hey, remember that guy that we were following that died, and we all got really depressed because we're like, it's over, the Jesus movement's dead. He's walking around again. He's talking again. He's teaching again. He's drawing people together again. And then he got everyone together, and then he floated away. And everyone went, we can't sit on this. This needs to be told everywhere. So what happened was, is that from the resurrection, a group of people started to form. These people were referred to as the way. They were followers of the way. They were followers of the way of Jesus. It stood against the traditional structure that was happening with uh, the Jewish religion at the time. And they were saying, we don't, we don't think that God is, um, is, is like this picture anymore. We actually have a picture of who God is and what he's for, and it looks like Jesus. And these people started to gather and gather, and they kept saying, alive, alive, alive. We don't know what to tell you. We just know that he was dead, now he's alive. And what happened from that is that these people started to go, we've got to write this down. We've got to record this. This is important. And they started to make this scroll. Uh, they started to get manuscripts together. They started to write down what was happening. Now, it's very important to note that this here happened in the first hundred years. So this here happened in the first hundred years. Jesus was resurrected. People came together. A few smart people went, we've got to write it down. And they started to make accounts of Jesus' life. And they put it onto paper. And in the first hundred years, there were documents going around telling the story of Jesus. And that's where we get the stories from what was happening at that point there. Now, it's very important to point this out. A few hundred years later, we get to the Bible. We'll get to that in a second. But if it wasn't for the resurrection, then the people wouldn't have gathered and they wouldn't have written down what they had experienced. So sometimes when the Bible gets presented to us, it says, here's the Bible. These are the Bible stories. Here's the story of Jesus. It's the wrong way around. The Bible doesn't inform us about Jesus. Jesus and his story informs the Bible. We wouldn't have a modern day Bible, we wouldn't have a Bible if it wasn't for Jesus, if it wasn't for people writing down these accounts, collecting them together. So for the next few weeks, we're going to explore just one account of Jesus' life. We're going to have a look at a guy called Luke, and we're going to have a look at how he informs us about Jesus as to why we know what we know and why we follow so the reason I introduced the message that I did with this little timeline is because I wanted to ground into us right now how we got to where we are when it comes to the Bible. And in fact, it's the very way that Luke starts his um, story by grounding his readers into a specific time period. So let's have a look at the book of Luke. First chapter, first verse, first word, Luke 1.1. 1, 1. It says, many, many. How many, Luke? Don't know. Could have been four could have been 40. But when someone says many, it means there are many. Many have what? Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Do you know how many people will undertake an account of your life and my life? Probably not many. <laughs> no offense to you and to me. Um, but the chances are not many. In fact, not many undertook to draw up an account about anybody in ancient times. Like these days, if you want to have your story, you can get your pen and paper, you can get your, your, your tablet out, you can get your, your computer out, and you could just say, this is the account of, and you could write it out. But back then, that is not how materials worked. It took, um, a year, you know, not many people had accounts of their lives drawn up. An interesting thing that not many people realize, when you go back and look at ancient uh, characters, people like Tiberius Caesar, uh, there's nothing really on him. There's nothing really on Pilate. Um, Herod the Great, who did extraordinary things. We have an account of his life, but it's based on his secretary's account, which, you know, so we have one account based on one account. And do you know how many detailed narrative accounts we have on the life of an ancient peasant or crucified criminal or even first century rabbis? Pretty much none. Now we have stories, we have quotes, but there's nothing close, there's nothing close to what Luke brings us about Jesus. So the question that you and I need to ask is why did Luke bother to bring us a detailed account of a Galilean day laborer turned rabbi who was executed by Rome. Why is that a story worth telling? Why does that matter? And why would others, why would many 
attempt the same thing. The question really is, why so many? Why so many? The only reason that so many would do that is because something extraordinary happened. Many didn't go out of their way to write accounts about nothing. It was expensive to make things back then. So what happened was something that was extraordinary, that had implications for future generations. It was something that was good, and it was something that had to be told to the rest of the world. So it goes on, Luke 1, 1 to 3. It says, Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Now, he's not saying among them. He's saying among us. He's saying our contemporaries. This happened in his lifetime. Luke knew the men and the women that were involved in this amazing story. Just as they were handed down to us by those who were first eyewitnesses and servants of the word, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated. It means carefully followed, paid close attention. Luke didn't just go and say, hey, tell me the story, tell me the story, tell me the story, sounds about right, chuck it on. Luke carefully investigated. He heard testimonies. He fact-checked. He laid it out and he said, I'm going to put it all together. Everything from the beginning. Everything from the beginning. Which is why Luke actually starts his story with Jesus and John the Baptist to give us the whole story. It says, I too, along with many others, decided to to write an orderly account for you. That's how Luke opens up his his letter. It's how he opens up his writings. It's how he opens up his document. And here's my point. When Luke is doing this, When he's carefully investigating, when he's bringing the pieces together, when he's putting this writing out, we need to be careful. Luke is not writing the Bible. All right? There's no Bible. It doesn't exist yet. Luke is not going, got to get this right. One day it's going to be in the Bible. He has no concept of that. Luke is back here with these people making an account of what these people have experienced. So Luke is not writing the Bible. He didn't go and say, I've got to write the Bible, I've got to get this right. He's just documenting the events that are happening around him. He's documenting the life of the teachings of Jesus, which means that we actually take Luke's account seriously, not because it's in the Bible, but because it mattered to what was happening at the time. It points to something true that was happening at the time, Luke, Luke's account of the life of Jesus was actually included into the Bible because it was considered reliable when it was written. Let me put it another way. Um, if you've ever been out and you've gone to a hotel and you open up the door, you see like the little safes in the, in, hidden away in hotels? You see them, like little hotel safes? When you go on holiday and you take your valuable stuff with you and you go into your hotel and you open the door and you see the safe there, You go and you grab your valuable stuff and you put it into the safe. Now, was putting the stuff into the safe what made it valuable? No. Your stuff was valuable, so you put it into the safe. In the same way, when Luke was writing this, Luke wasn't writing the Bible. Luke was put into the Bible because it was considered reliable when it was written. So if you're someone who's struggling with faith or you're considering Christianity and you're wondering, what do I do with the Bible? The question isn't, is the Bible true? The question you should be asking is, is Luke lying? Is Luke telling the truth? You don't have to go and believe everything that's in the Bible, but the question we need to ask about the life of Jesus and the things that are happening, the events that are going on, the question we need to be asking, is Luke a reliable and accurate witness to what had happened? happened. Is Luke lying? He can't be mistaken because he said, I carefully investigated everything from the beginning. So he either did that or he didn't do that. But we know that Luke believes his own account. He claims that what follows actually happened and that his account is based on the conversations of who was there and of what he witnessed happen in community. They saw something extraordinary happen. It was good. It's good for the world. He continues on, with this in mind, Luke's writing, with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So Theophilus was a, uh, probably a wealthy and curious new believer, believer who's gone, I've got to know about this, and funds this little expedition. Luke goes out there and says, I put this all together, I did the job well, I got all my sources checked, I got them double checked, and here is an account of the life of Jesus, so that, so that you may have certainty of the things you have been taught. So that you may have certainty of the things that you have been taught. 
Luke wanted to ensure that Theophilus would not be left with the impression and that you and I subsequently would not be left with the impression that Christianity is about having faith in faith. Luke went around, he heard the accounts, he put it together, he gave a document saying these are the events that happened and I've given them to you as a testimony, as a testament, as a witness to what has happened so that you, Theophilus, so that you, future church, do not have to go, I'm just having faith in faith. No, 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 no. Luke wanted to ensure that his readers were anchored to the event. Anchored to the event which launched the movement. The movement that made it safe hundreds of years later for bishops to come out of hiding and eventually put together the Bible. The Bible. And I want you to pay attention to this because this is really, really, really important. As he was writing an account of the life of Jesus, Luke didn't know that his account would be one of many that would be put into the Bible. Luke had no idea. Luke wasn't there going, I've got to get this right because one day it's going to be in the Bible. Luke just went, this is what happened. And people went, that's what happened. When they formed the Bible together, they went, Luke is reliable and accurate. It was helpful back here and it's helpful now. It's helpful today. Luke's copy of his document was meticulously copied. It was distributed to gatherings of Christians. They memorized it. They passed it around. And what actually happened at one point is that a Roman emperor named Diocletian actually realized, hmm, I can't get rid of these Christians until I get rid of their literature. He went around. He went, these pesky Christians, they've got these books and they're these things they're copying around and these letters and they keep talking about Jesus. I really just want to sort of kill that because they keep praising Jesus. I want them to praise me. And he went around and he tries to get rid of them. He goes, hang on a second. Because they've got these documents, because they've got these letters, they keep on getting their faith rebuilt up. So he goes and he, th- he tries to get rid of it all. But by the, set, by the um, time that that happened, by the beginning of the fourth century, Luke's document had been copied and been given so far and wide that Diocletian could not come and destroy it all. And then this is where something remarkable happens. Eventually, Emperor Constantine turns to Christianity and he allows Christians to worship publicly and to bring their literature out. And here's something which is really, really incredible. I don't want you to miss this. You ready? The empire that had crucified Jesus now financially backed the assembly of the first Bible. Isn't that incredible? Like we take this for granted that it's assembled for the first 300 years after the event was the movement, was the documents, was persecution, was death, was hiding, was all sorts of horrible things. And then eventually the empire responsible turns around and funds the collection of our first Bible. That's amazing. Like, that is an incredible little piece of history. I mean, talk about a twist in the story. If you'd said, hey, people back here, one day this empire that is totally against you is one day actually going to be making the Bible happen, you'd be like, no way. No way that that happens. Give it some time, and it happened. Thousands of manuscripts of the account of Jesus were collected, compared, authorized, and collated together. So the stories of Jesus in the Bible aren't Bible stories. The stories of Jesus in the Bible is the whole story, the complete picture. At the end of all four Gospels, Jesus is crucified by Rome, he's buried, and then he rises again. Jesus rose from the dead, something happens in the world, and that's why we're here. It comes down to the four Gospels. So as we wrap up this first installment of our series, I want to be clear and leave you with this. All right, if you're someone who struggles with your faith, or if you're someone who chooses not to follow Jesus and the reason for you not wanting to follow Jesus is because it's just inconvenient, I get that. I understand that. It is inconvenient to follow Jesus. It is. Following Jesus will require something of you and something from you. It will require you to be less selfish. It will require you to be more forgiving. It will require radical acts of grace and times when people look at you and say, why are you letting them back into your life? Why are you re-establishing relationship? Why are you forgiving them? Why are you choosing to do that with your finances? Why? Why? Because when you follow Jesus, you get a perspective and God starts to change things in your life. I get it. It's inconvenient. It's hard. It's difficult. I do think, however, that if you follow Jesus, it'll make your life better and make you better at life. But if you go and say, if 
following Jesus is just too inconvenient. I go, yep, I get that. That is, I see that. That's a valid excuse. You've looked at the life of Jesus. You've weighed it up and you went, it's too hard for me. That's fine. That's fine. But I don't ever want anyone to ever go, I don't believe in Jesus because there's nothing to the story of Jesus. Because there is. Have you investigated, if you're someone who's, who's, who, who's maybe turned away from your faith a bit, or someone who's never really looked at the story of Jesus, have you ever actually looked as an adult? Have you ever looked as an adult into the story of Jesus? Have you ever investigated for yourself with an adult um, pair of eyes on? Because despite what you've heard in university or you've heard in culture, there is a story, an event there And I don't want you to give up on your faith because you didn't investigate the life of Jesus seriously. The only good reason not to follow is if you've determined, not that the Bible's not trustworthy, but if you've gone and determined that Luke, that Matthew, that Mark, that John are not trustworthy. If you turn around and say that I don't have faith in God because I can't believe the whole Bible, that's fine. Your faith in God was never based on having faith in the whole Bible. Your faith in God is actually based on Jesus. Is what Matthew, Mark, Luke and John accurate and reliable? Is it trustworthy? So I challenge you, go and read the Gospel of Luke. Go read the book, uh, the, the book of Acts because Luke wrote that as well and investigate for yourself. Look at the event yourself. Talk to people who follow Jesus because I believe there's relevance for you there in your life for here and now. The story of the resurrection of Jesus had to be told. It had to be shared. It was something that was too amazing that it couldn't stay quiet. And Luke went and told the story. So we'll pick it up there next week for part two of investigating Jesus, how we know and why we follow. But before we go, I've got a question for you to consider. Um, A question for you to consider um, and what I'm going to say is going to make some of you nervous, and some of you have been nervous probably from the beginning of the message. That's fine. Um, because, I'll be honest with you, you got presented the Bible as a kid uh, or when you first came to faith in a way that was really unhelpful. You got presented as the Bible of, here it is, it's all God word, God's Word, it's all true, you must believe it all or you can't have faith in Jesus. Some of you got that presented. And if that's the case, that's, that's a church problem, not a you problem, because that's not how it came to be. The people back here... His faith was not based on a whole Bible, everything's true or not. These people back here saw an event, saw an account of Jesus' life and went, this is life changing. So here's the statements up on the screen. What, what's your initial response to the suggestion that the Christian faith rises or falls on the reliability of the Gospels rather than the reliability of the whole Bible? Don't have to answer out loud. Um, it's more of an internal thing. What's your response to that? Because for some of you, you're going to read that and you're going to be like, "Mm, nope, 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 nope. It's true from Genesis through Revelation, every bit's 100% as it is, otherwise my faith falls over. Again, that's a church problem. We presented you a house of cards that falls over as soon as one piece gets dislodged, as soon as one question isn't quite right, as soon as one perspective is slightly shifted. We know things now from history, from science, from things that are just different. And it's okay to come to faith in God, believing it's 100% Genesis, 100% true, or that it's a story. Both are okay because it's in the story of Jesus that we find our connection to God, not the reliability of the whole Bible. And when you were younger, someone came to you with the Bible and said, you've got to believe everything, and that was unwise. And that may have been a barrier for you to meet Jesus. And I'm not saying that your end result may be that the whole Bible is 100% true as it is, but that's not the way into faith. The way into faith is through Jesus, and from there it's a journey. When the Bible is presented as all equally valid, it means that we end up with a problem that it's either all true or none true. And then many of us lose faith because someone comes along and points something out and our faith falls over because we go, it can't happen. Just a quick story. Um, a while ago, um, uh, I was having a chat to somebody and we were just talk, talking about Genesis and um, he was talking about some creation stuff. And I, I just was having a chat and I said, oh, what do you think about, and, uh, about this? And I just proposed something. I wasn't saying I was committed to it. I was a sort of uh, conversation. You know, when you're having a conversation with somebody, it started off with, what do you think about this idea? Which I wasn't even fully committed to. I was just asking a question. Ten minutes later, 
voices are raised and the statement that comes out of the other person's mouth is, well, if Genesis is not true, then how can you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? And I just calmly looked at it and I said, well, my faith is not actually based on whether Genesis is true or not because I met Jesus. And I looked at him and he looked at me and it was just this weird, this weird moment where I'm going, your whole faith is based on something which for many people is not even part of their world. For the people who are moving in the event of the resurrection, for them, they weren't going around trying to defend a, the Bible. They were trying to grapple with the fact that a man was dead, is now alive, and we have a way to reconnect with our Heavenly Father. And then this came later. So, what's your initial response to the suggestion that the Christian faith rises and falls on the reliability of the Gospels rather than the reliability of the whole Bible. And here's the reason why this is extremely, extremely important. For those of us who are over 40, over 30, I dare say, probably over 25, embracing this distinction is going to be one of the keys to recapturing and safeguarding the faith of the next generation. Embracing this distinction is going to be a key to recapturing and safeguarding the faith of the next generation. Because we do not have children growing up in the Bible's account of how life began. We do not have children growing up in a the Bible's way of operating for ethics. We do not have a children growing up in a the Bible's way of how we should live. And our initial reaction is to want to go in there and just go, but don't you know what the Bible says? And we need to not do that. And we need to take them back to Jesus. We need to take them back to the real story. That God, in his infinite wisdom, gave us an example of how to live and reconnected us to our Heavenly Father. Embracing this distinction is going to be a key to recapturing and safeguarding the faith of the next generation. Otherwise, you will lose your children and grandchildren over things that don't matter. They're going to lose their faith because of an unreliable Bible rather than, is Jesus actually resurrected? Let's base our faith on the event that started the movement that led to the accounts that we have in our Bible. Let's not base it on this and go the wrong way around. Let me pray. Help me, Jesus, to keep the main thing the main thing. Your resurrection is the starting point of why we believe what we believe. Help me not to be distracted from this and help me keep moving in your direction day by day. Amen.